people have a right to know that cell phones are two-way microwave radios, that they're not toys, that they should never be given to children for any length of time. If you must give a child an electronic device, download what you want them to see, if it's a movie or a game, and put it on airplane mode. That way you reduce, eliminate the microwave radiation. People have a right to know that you can protect yourself by using airplane mode, that when a phone signal is weak, you should not use a phone unless it's a true emergency, because the phone is smart and it will use more radiation, and half of the radiation from a phone gets into you, so long as the phone is in your pocket or next to your body. Which is why the manufacturers tell people that they should not use a phone within five millimeters of the body. Environmental Health Trust says that's not enough distance. It should be much further away. Uh, a few inches, but overall, we want people to know that cell phones are microwave devices and they need to be treated with care. And we need to work to make sure that the technology becomes safer and that we come up with ways to use them that are safer for our children and my grandchildren as well. There are some technical solutions. We know, for example, that when the French government recalled phones, all they had to do for many of them was to reprogram the software. The operating system of phones for many phones now is going to do a handshake to the tower from the phone 900 times a minute. That's not necessary. You don't need to be sending signals back and forth that frequently. And every time they check in with the tower, the phone goes to max power. And it's the peaks that we're concerned about. It's not the power, it's the pulse. It's the da 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 It's the irregular pulse that disturbs our resonating cells. We are, after all, electric beings. Our hearts and our brain depend on electricity. We have to have it in order to live. But when it's disrupted by this cacophony of multiple sources of wireless radiation, then we're disturbing the natural rhythm of the body that has evolved over millions of years of hominid evolution. Unfortunately, there has been this pattern of trying to attack the scientists and the science, and then using public relations techniques to undermine both of them. And they've been fairly successful, as in the case of Henry Lai and Vijay Singh, two of the most brilliant scientists we had in this field. Um, Henry Lai is no longer working in this field because his support dried up. And once you produce results that are inconvenient, that tends to happen. It happened as well with, with Jerry Phillips. Uh, it almost happened with me. But in fact, I've been very fortunate because I was able to take um, income that I got from other places and use it to continue to do this work. That's how I wrote my book, Disconnect. I was aware that there were some forces at the university that did not want me to continue doing this work. And I decided I would be able to work more independently with Environmental Health Trust rather than be part of a large bureaucracy that was increasingly going to be depending on wireless radiation as has happened at many universities around the world. At this point though, I'm encouraged by the fact that around the world, some groups are recognizing the need to go with less wireless and even to re reduce wireless. So for example, my colleague, Dr. Stella McLuhadu in Cyprus is succeeding in getting them to, to try no wireless around neonatal intensive care units. She's been very persuasive. There's a public campaign on buses with the buses completely decorated with slogans that say we must protect our children and some very videos that are totally charming and very effective. So we are seeing success certainly in some, in some areas, and even in the United States we have success. We have some localities that are recommending wired in schools, certainly for elementary schools. We have the Maryland State Governor's Commission on Public Health, which has recommended going wired in schools as opposed to wireless. And we have some schools in Massachusetts and California and Pennsylvania that have gone wired and will not have wireless. There are signs at kindergartens all over California, turn off your phone if you're a parent coming in here. This is a cell phone free zone. 
and there's even pressure to make cell phone free zones in other spaces. I think we are with cell phones today where we were with cars in the 1960s when people said we needed airbags and seat belts and other people said no, it's fine and it's going to bankrupt the industry. It will bankrupt us if we have to put airbags and seat belts on. Well, on the contrary, airbags and seat belts helped to revive the American automobile industry. And the same thing was, uh, ha has been true, I think, for those that are going to make safer phones and technologies. So we want to encourage industry to make safer phones and devices. The trick is they're going to be sued, as they ought to be, for the fact that they've caused brain cancer and other diseases in people who've used phones for a long time. And the industry has known for some time about the dangers of cell phone radiation. Uh, we have the book Cell Phone Russian Roulette, yeah. and the book tells the story of a Motorola engineer who was one of the early guinea pigs. And the book was published in the early 2000s, and he basically documented his own history of being exposed to levels of radiation that gave him a headache. They were very high levels, and he subsequently developed a brain tumor, and uh, the industry denied there was anything to it. Uh, unfortunately, he died, but he did manage to self-publish his book on uh, cell phone radiation as a form of Russian roulette, which, as you know, it's like taking a gun to your head and spinning the cartridge and not knowing whether there's a bullet that's going to fire. And unfortunately for him, there were several bullets, and he did develop and die from brain cancer. But now there are many others who have done that. And while we debate uh, whether we have enough dead bodies, the proof is right in front of our faces. We have for years been amassing evidence in experiments on animals. And I believe we have to pay attention to what the animals are trying to tell us. The animal research is very important because every compound that we know for sure causes cancer in people will also produce it in animals when adequately studied. So to ignore animal studies puts us all at risk. And the arrogance of those who say, well, the mouse does this and the rat does that, that's really not germane. We have many examples in medicine where you can only produce tumors in a rat or a mouse and not in both. And we seldom get the same tumor in animals as we have in people. And the National Toxicology Program actually did that. They found tumors of the brain and tumors of the nerve within the heart, schwannoma, which are exactly like the tumors that we see in people. And that's really upsetting to all of us who work in this field. And we are seeing multiple tumors in other organs, as well as DNA damage. And so this is, I think, should be a big wake-up call. The, <clears throat> among the many unfortunate developments here, normally, when the US National Toxicology Program produces a result like this, it triggers regulatory action and a risk assessment that says, if these exposures continue in the United States, we will have X number of brain cancers in Y number of years. That risk assessment is not being done. And the reason it's not being done is the forces to say, wait, this animal study is different from all the others you've done. All the other animal studies have triggered us to take action, to reduce exposure to certain pesticides, to reduce exposure to certain metals, to reduce exposure to benzene, each of which has been shown to cause cancer in animals. But in this case, although you have the largest study ever done for $30 million over more than a decade to be completed, we now decide that although we approved the results, we approved the methods, we used Swiss engineers to design the methodology for exposure, we're now going to reject those results because they're a bit inconvenient for this industry to which many of us are heavily addicted at this time. That is a tragedy for public health. It's a tragedy for public policy. When it comes to reproducing studies, there are many parameters. And one of the things we know just from the studies of brain damage, we know that cell phone radiation can damage the brain that's been developed in many studies. It's been demonstrated. But you must use immature cells. If you use lymphocytes, which are mature, you will not get an effect. Let me give you an example of a replication that was not a replication at all. Blood-brain barrier is the thing that protects the brain 
so that brain doesn't get exposed to things. It's supposed to protect us, okay? Studies were done in 1970 by the Office of Naval Research, and they found that animals that were injected into their vein with a dye showed that dye in their brain after exposure to cell phone radiation. A replication was done where they injected the dye in the stomach of animals, not in the vein, and did the same exposure. And they concluded there was no problem because 20 minutes later, there was no dye in the brain. But guess what? Even an animal takes more than 20 minutes to digest things in its stomach. And that so-called replication, which was touted as proof that there was no effect, was really a phony replication. And there often are studies that are inconclusive by design. And that's what we're dealing with here. The Danish Cancer Society so-called cohort is another example where they started with 700,000 people who were using cell phones in the early 1990s in Denmark. And they excluded from the population everyone that was a business user because they said, well, we can't be sure that the person who's registered to have the phone for the business is really using the phone. Let me tell you something. My father was a business user of a phone. He was in the military at the time. He was company commander of the 110th Infantry in Pennsylvania. And he had a phone in his car, and nobody was allowed to touch it. Guys that had phones in the early 1990s were military or doctors or business people, and they guarded those phones like it was the Holy Grail. And people weren't allowed to use them, believe me. And it cost $3,000 for the phone back then. That was a fortune. $1,000 a month to use it, and they were used very seldom. So think about this. They exclude the business users from the group. They only then follow up all the people who were not business users, many of whom were just dabbling and using a phone for curiosity. Like, oh, check this out. I can use it. And then 10 years later, 20 years later, they continue to study these people, excluding the business users. And now they're comparing the rate of cancer in the people who were amateur users of phones in the 1990s with everybody else, including the business users, including everybody that started to use a phone afterwards. So it's a completely in, incomparable set of circumstances. We're going to have the same problem with Moby Kids. Moby Kids is taking 600 cases of brain cancer and comparing the uses of phones with these kids that use cell phones with controls. But guess what? There are no controls. There are no controls. Every child now is using phones. Michael Kundi presented the data showing the incredible use of phones. It's 100% by the time you get to teens age 15 years old. So how are you going to be comparing brain cancer in children who started to use phones maybe in the late 1990s or 2000 with what's happening now? It's really not possible, particularly given that the Aiden study showed that the latency for brain cancer in children is less than three years. Think about this. If the latency for brain cancer is less than three years, and you're studying 600 cases of brain cancer that have already formed, and you're going to compare them with people, young people who are using phones now, there's no way you're going to be able to find anything because there's no true control group. There's no where in the world, in the modern industrial world, you're going to find children that aren't using phones extensively.